The next item of business uh, is consideration of business motion 15209 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revision to the business programme for today. Could I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button now and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 15209 please. Moved. Thank you. No member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. And the question is that motion number 15209 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. That then brings us to the next item of business, which is portfolio questions. And as time is tight across the whole afternoon, brevity would be much appreciated. Question number one, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how many employers in Scotland pay the living wage. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, information is not available on the overall number of employers paying the living wage, though we know many do, which is why we encourage them to become accredited. During last month's Living Wage Week, both the First Minister and myself, along with other ministerial colleagues, took part in a range of activities promoting the benefits of the living wage. So I'm pleased, of course, that the Scottish Government is one of over 425 Scots-based living wage accredited employers, with workers from uh, a number of different sectors uh, and different areas of Scotland benefiting from the substantial progress we're making. That figure continues to grow as we're fast approaching the, uh, the target of 500 set by the First Minister for achievement by March. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? As she knows, the, the UK's national living wage increase is not a living wage and does not support young people under 25. Could she tell us how many employees across Scotland earn a living wage or above? And how this compares across the UK? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we do know that uh, from the latest uh, figures, uh, over 80% of employees in Scotland are currently being paid uh, the living wage or higher. Uh, this represents a higher proportion than anywhere else in the United Kingdom, uh, with the single exception of the southeast of England. So it's a higher proportion uh, even than in London, and I think that's good news for Scots workers. Many thanks. Question number two, Paul Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to tackle unemployment in Glasgow problem. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> the Scottish Government is committed to increasing employment levels and to helping unemployed people across Scotland achieve their full potential. Employment in Scotland is now at a level above its pre-recession peak in 2008, with the employment rate in Scotland higher than the UK average. Employment levels in Glasgow have also seen an increase over the past year, whilst unemployment has fallen. The government continues to invest in a wide range of employment initiatives in Glasgow uh, and uh, I'm happy to uh, discuss that further with the member. Paul Martin. President, officer, the minister may recall a statement that was made in March 2014 in connection with the European Youth Guarantee uh, worth £1.1 uh, over two years to be spent in both the south and the west of Scotland. Now, the condition uh, of the additional European funding as it would be committed uh, during the period of 2015 financial year. Uh, I wonder if the Minister could advise us what progress has been made in that respect. Minister. Um, I, I thank the member for his uh, question. Uh, this uh, I actually falls within the jurisdiction of another Cabinet Secretary, so what I will arrange to do is to ensure that the member's uh, question is passed on to Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown because he, his officials are dealing with European Social Fund uh, monies, if that's acceptable. Many thanks. Question number three, Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its discussions with the UK Government regarding the apprenticeship levy. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. I last spoke to UK Government Ministers on the 26th of November uh, when I confirmed our agreement to establish a working group of senior officials from across all four nations to manage the transition from the current arrangements. In addition, a four nations senior officials group has been established by Treasury to discuss the allocation of the levy to the devolved administrations. In our discussions with Treasury and uh, Biz, the objective is to achieve the best outcome uh, for Scotland. While we now know what the rate and scope of the apprenticeship levy will be when it is introduced in April 2017, we have still to be provided with the clarity on how Scotland's share of the levy raised will be calculated and transferred to the Scottish Government. Christina McKelvey. Um, can, I, can I welcome that Four Nations Working Group and the, the fact that the Four Nations voices will be heard in that, but does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the UK Government really need, uh, as a matter of urgency, to provide clarity to both business, of which I have had approaches from, and the Scottish Government, and how they intend the apprenticeship levy to operate? Cabinet Secretary. I think that's incredibly important. We know that it's going to be at a rate of 0.5% of a, a pay bill over 
£3 million, which means we think about uh, uh, companies about 120 employees will be caught uh, in this 120 upwards. Um, it, it is therefore unfortunate that we still don't have clarity on how Scotland's share of the levy will be calculated because obviously many of those companies will be cross-border uh, and some employees will be in Scotland, some will be uh, elsewhere in the United Kingdom. Um, but once we have the clarity, uh, I will be working directly with employers and other stakeholders to explore how the funding from the levy can benefit employers, young people, and support the growth and enhancement of our successful apprenticeship programme. As I said, I'm working with my counterparts in Wales and Northern Ireland who have similar issues with the UK government on lack of clarity on the levy. John Payland. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me what discussions has the Scottish Government had with industry bodies, both those based here in Scotland and those based elsewhere in the UK, and others providing apprenticeship training regarding the impact of the levy? on your current apprenticeship schemes? Cabinet. Well, uh, a number of us have had conversations, both formal and informal. I've spoken, for example, to the Chamber of Commerce in Scotland, to the Scottish Retail Consortium, uh, all of whom have members who uh, are very concerned at the, the point we were having those discussions. At that point, we still didn't even know the rate or the scope, which was introducing an enormous amount of uncertainty into the process. We still have no certainty uh, about the way this is going to be uh, uh, divided up in terms of uh, uh, the Treasury uh, decision-making process and we uh, continue to press the UK Government to allow us to be able to have meaningful conversations uh, with business about how we will progress once we know that certainty. Many thanks. Question number four, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Can I apologise for being a few mo moments late at the start of the session and can I ask the Scottish Government what the implications are for skills and training of its proposed national infrastructure priority on energy efficiency. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, as the member knows, the cornerstone of the national infrastructure priority will be Scotland's energy efficiency, efficiency programme, which will uh, bring an integrated approach to energy efficiency provision of heat to reduce energy costs and greenhouse gas emissions for domestic and non-domestic properties throughout Scotland. Uh, work to develop that programme is underway. There has been significant development of new skills to support our current energy efficiency and low carbon programmes and we will consider what skills and training are required to develop the necessary capacity in the sector as the new programme is piloted and developed. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. As the Cabinet Secretary makes clear, we're yet to see the detail on how this infrastructure priority will pan out, what the practical implications uh, or indeed the scale of work are going to be required. But we have been told that it will impact on every building in Scotland. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that that implies a dramatic increase in the availability and in the breadth of skills that we're providing on energy assessment, on installation, and hopefully on the design and manufacture of some of the materials and equipment that will be installed so that the highest quality jobs that are supported by that programme are based in Scotland? Uh, well, I would definitely agree with that. I think there's a tremendous opportunity open here in terms of uh, employment and in terms of skills. We are already doing a lot of work in this area. We're engaging with Skills Development Scotland and partners to support skills uptake in low carbon technologies through uh, vehicles such as the Low Carbon Skills Fund, Modern Apprenticeships, Flexible Training Opportunities and Individual Learning Accounts. And the Low, the low Carbon Skills Fund ha has supported more than 3,000 training opportunities in low carbon technologies since 2010-11. There's other work going on through the Energy Saving Trust and Resource Efficient Scotland, uh, and uh, uh, we are including uh, 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 other work to develop the capacity of the workforce. Of course, as this rolls out, there will be niche opportunities uh, becoming apparent. It's a little difficult to foresee exactly what they will be in advance, but we are ready uh, and, uh, uh, and willing to ensure that the best possible results come for the labour market in Scotland. Many thanks. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. South Lancashire College won the Homes for Scotland Award for work on sustainable construction. It has both a low energy, low carbon, usable teaching block and a house where those training can practice with airtight, thermal, thermally efficient design. What support is envisaged by the Scottish Government and partners in the transformation needed in building techniques uh, and how will they be able to develop uh, such practical models uh, as the one at South Lanarkshire College across South Scotland and beyond. Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, some of the things that I've already uh, raised in respect of uh, the previous member's question uh, will involve a, a wide range of uh, events, workshops and other support right across Scotland, including with uh, colleges. And I want to commend 
uh, South Lanarkshire College for the work that they're doing. Um, they're a very, college sector is very vital uh, in respect of all the skills development that goes on. We did um, refresh the skills investment plan for the energy sector uh, last year, uh, and that was developed in partnership with a variety of different bodies. Colleges would have had some input uh, in respect of that. Uh, and uh, uh, this is, I mean, obviously has to be an ongoing uh, and continually developing uh, sector, uh, and therefore we have to be able to operate as quickly as possible when we see opportunities develop. Colleges are key to that. Thank you. Question number five, Colin Beatty. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on reports that the gender pay gap in Scotland is 7.3% compared with 9.4% in the UK. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, the, the member is correct to say that the figures published by the uh, ONS uh, last month show that the gender pay gap in Scotland has been persistently lower than that for the UK. Uh, relative to the UK, recent falls in the gender pay, back, pay cap in Scotland have been driven by the growth of female earnings in Scotland. Uh, other factors contributing, contributing to the narrower pay gap in Scotland include increases in the number of older female workers and the fact that the gap is smaller in Scotland for the highest 10% of earners. But I, I'm sure that the member would agree with me uh, that the fact that we're still talking about this in 21st century Scotland, 45 years after the coming into force of the Equal Pay Act at Westminster, is really uh, beyond comprehension, presiding officer. Uh, so uh, that is why the Scottish Government has made it a priority in our programme for government to seek to address the factors giving rise to the gender pay gap to the extent that we have the power to do so. Thank you, Colin Beatty. I thank the Minister for her response. Uh, I'm sure the Minister will agree with me that despite this good news, any gender pay gap is too high. C can the Minister outline what steps the Scottish Government is taking specifically to help continue to reduce the gap? Minister. Well, uh, as I have said in my first uh, response, the, the, the Scottish Government sees this, uh, this as a, an absolute priority and will seek to do whatever we can within the powers that we have. Uh, so some of the action we are taking uh, uh, is... in. in informs uh, the broad approach that we have to take to this issue. So, for example, we're tackling the underrepresentation of women in senior management roles and in the boardroom, boardroom through our Partnership for Change campaign. We are strengthening our commitment to pay transparency by reducing the threshold at which public authorities must report on their pay gap from 150 to over 20 employees. And, of course, we continue uh, to promote fair work practices and to extend childcare uh, provision. Uh, there is no one single answer to this problem, and we will do everything that we possibly can to ensure that in 21st century, century Scotland we can finally stop talking about a gender pay gap. Many thanks. <laughs> Question number six, Jenny Mara, has not been lodged. Uh, no explanation has been provided. I'm afraid this is the second week running with no explanation. It's not acceptable, and I trust an explanation will now be forthcoming. Question number seven, Cara Hilton cannot be called because, I'm afraid, uh, Cara Hilton is unable to be in the chamber and an explanation has been provided for that. So I now call question number eight, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what information it has on how youth employment in Scotland compares with the rest of the European Union. Minister Annabelle Young. Latest data from Eurostat shows that Scotland has the third highest youth employment rate at 54.6% across the European Union countries for quarter two of 2015. Only the Netherlands at 61.3% and Denmark at 55.9% were ahead of Scotland. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, I thank the Minister for her reply, and that's uh, very welcome news, although overtaking the Netherlands and Denmark should remain an objective. Uh, but can she say what uh, investment is being made to improve opportunities for Scotland, uh, for young people across Scotland, so we can get to number one? Minister. Uh, well, I share the, the member's ambition to, to always seek to get to, to number one. Uh, the Scottish Government has, in fact, been taking a number of initiatives and making a number of investments to ensure that we do everything we can uh, such that young people uh, can fulfil their potential in life. Uh, for example, of course, we have invested over last year in this, uh, 12 million last year and 16.6 million this year, in uh, embedding our developing young workforce uh, uh, principles and policies. We also, of course, have uh, provided 25, over 25,000 modern apprenticeship starts year on year. 
uh, with some 101,000 modern apprenticeship opportunities having been delivered in this parliamentary term. We have ambitions to go further, presiding officer, to secure 30,000 modern apprenticeship starts by 2020. Uh, we also, of course, work uh, with Scot Skills Development Scotland in terms of uh, employability activity. We invest in Community Jobs Scotland, th operated through the SCVO. We have extended the eligibility for the educational maintenance uh, allowance. There are a number of other initiatives and we work with Inspiring Scotland uh, to help uh, young people in the 14 to 19 age bracket. So we are conducting a number of activities across a range of areas to ensure that we do everything we can. I'm pleased to note in that regard that in the labour market statistics published this very morning, we see that youth employment has increased by 20,000 over uh, the past year. So we recognise that we are going in the right direction, but we do recognise that we have more to do. Thank you, Mayor Scanlon. Uh, thank you. Is the Minister satisfied that all school pupils in line with the Wood Commission recommendations who want to attend further education for vocational work experience and qualifications are in fact given the opportunity to do so? Minister. Uh, well, uh, I would uh, hope that that is the case. Of course, our youth employment strategy has uh, set out a series of uh, uh, detailed targets over a seven year uh, period. Uh, uh, and we just uh, published, in fact, uh, last week or so, the annual report, the first annual report on the developing young workforce uh, in terms of our uh, refreshed youth employment strategy. Uh, if the member has any particular uh, instance of concern that she would wish to raise with me or indeed the, the Cabinet Secretary responsible, Angela Constance, I would be very happy to pursue that. Thank you. Question number nine, Alison McInnes. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Scottish Women's Development Forum report, a study of the perceptions and experience of police officers and staff during pregnancy and maternity. Minister Annabelle Ewing. Uh, the Scottish Government is clear that we want to see no barriers to what women can achieve in the workplace. We provide funding to the Scottish Women's Development Forum and we welcome the Police Negotiating Board Agreement to increase occupational and maternity leave for Scottish police officers from 1st April 2016. A key priority for Police Scotland is the recruitment and retention of women officers and staff and they recognise that this report highlights important areas of improvement within the service that will help them to embed equality and diversity throughout their policies and procedures. I was pleased to note that the report from the Scottish Women's Development Forum was welcomed by Police Scotland and the Human Resources Committee of the SPA uh, have accepted all of the recommendations. Thank the Minister for that response. Uh, the report um, shows that even when the law is clear and the right HR policies are in place, they are not always followed and are open to misinterpretation by line managers. And that's something that happens across um, employers. Maternity actions say that all the available evidence suggests that pregnancy and maternity discrimination is now more common than ever before, estimating that as many as 60,000 women in the UK are pushed out of work each year. Does the Minister agree with me that action to tackle that discrimination is overdue? And will she take this opportunity to send a strong message to employers in Scotland that it is time for change and do what she can to ensure the public sector leads the way? And would the Scottish Government consider commissioning research into the prevalence of pregnancy and maternity discrimination Minister. in the workplace? Um, OK, uh, trying to deal with each point in turn on the issue of Police Scotland, I understand that they will be shortly publishing a new Pregnancy and Maternity Guidance Pack. An updated standard operating procedure and additional reference material will be available on both the intranet and the internet. Uh, and so I, I think we will see practical steps being taken within Police Scotland uh, that uh, I'm sure the member would uh, uh, commend. In terms of the wider issue, I absolutely agree with the member that it is unacceptable that we see any discrimination in the area of maternity, uh, pregnancy and maternity. Uh, there is some work being done by the UK government. I understand that has been delayed, but when we get that uh, response that they are preparing, we will work with the EHRC uh, uh, as the Scottish Government to see what we can do. And we will at all times uh, uh, make sure that we uh, make a, uh, the message uh, very clearly that this is unacceptable behaviour uh, in the 21st century. Thank you. Call question number 10, but brevity would be appreciated. Ian Gray. The Scottish Government what action it is taking to address the reported shortage of 11,000 professionals with digital skills 
particularly in relation to computer coding training. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we are working in partnership with public sector partners and industry representatives to address skills issues in Scotland's digital sector with a programme of work built around the recommendations in 2014's ICT and Digital Technologies Skills Investment Plan. Uh, a prime example of the collaborative work is the recent opening of Code Clan, uh, an industry-led digital skills academy based in the heart of Edinburgh. Thank you, Ian Gray. The Cabinet Secretary will know that earlier this year the Education Committee received evidence that in recent years we have lost over 200 computer science teachers in schools and that teacher training places remain unfilled. As a result, some 12 per cent of Scotland's secondary schools do not teach computer science at all. What action is the Scottish Government taking to address this crisis in computer science education? Cabinet Secretary. There are a number of things that are being pursued uh, at every level of education, uh, including colleges and universities. Uh, as the member knows perfectly well, uh, the situation in high schools would be a matter that he ought to raise directly with uh, the Education Secretary, Angela Constance, and I will alert her to his concern about that particular issue. Many thanks. We now turn to questions on social justice communities and pensioners' rights, and I would appreciate brief questions and answers in this section too, please. Question number one, Richard Lyle. Thank you, Mr. President. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action is it taking to looking after the welfare of older people? Cabinet Secretary Alec Neil. Presenting officer, we have a long-standing commitment to improving the welfare of older people throughout Scotland. We have taken decisive action in a number of areas, including investing in services and initiatives designed to empower and improve the lives of older people, including free personal and nursing care, a record £119 million this year for fuel poverty and energy efficiency, the concessionary <laughs> travel scheme for older and disabled people, supporting a number of social prescription pilot projects in Glasgow and introducing free prescriptions. We are also committed to working with older people and older people's organisations to ensure that the quality of life for older people in Scotland continues to improve. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, very welcome answer and ask him if he agrees with me that policies like the concessionary bus travel scheme is one which delivers for older people in our communities across Scotland and indeed tackles issues of isolation. Can I also ask if he can tell me what action has been taking, taken this festive period to ensure that we are aware of isolation of older people in our communities, particularly important at this time of year. Cabinet Secretary. I would agree totally with the member about the benefits of the concessionary bus travel scheme, and I think it makes a major contribution in the prevention area uh, to stopping isolation, stopping depression amongst older people. There is no doubt about that. In terms of provision during the festive season, obviously every service is making their own arrangements, but generally I would draw attention to the Silver Line, which is Age Scotland's free helpline for older people, which offers information, advice and a befriending service for older people throughout the year, including at this time of year, and of course it's supported by the Scottish Government. Many thanks. Question number two has not been lodged. An explanation has been provided. I therefore call question number three, Joan McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what information it has regarding how many single parents in Scotland have been subject to benefit sanctions in the last year. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, in the year ending June 2015, a total of 1,854 job seekers allowance sanctions were applied to 1,207 loan parents in Scotland. We have no information on loan parents on receipt of other benefits who have been sanctioned. Thank you. John McAlpine. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. It is very worrying that a vulnerable group like single parents and their children are subject to sanctions, particularly as a study last week by the charity Crisis found that one in five people questioned became homeless as a result of sanctions. And the Crisis survey also found that sanctions had risen sharply among homeless people and particularly among those with a mental health problem. Does the Minister agree with me that pushing already vulnerable people into homelessness is completely unacceptable in a civilised society? And for that reason, the Scotland Bill was totally wrong to leave responsibility for sanctions in the hand hands of Westminster. Cabinet Secretary. 
presiding officer, I totally agree with every sentiment issued uh, by the member. And can I say what was depressing, particularly, not only was the crisis report depressing in terms of the impact of sanctions on some of the most vulnerable people in our society, but the response of the Department of Work and Pensions was utterly unacceptable, trying to deny that sanctions are having such a detrimental impact. I'm sure any MSP who does surgeries on a regular basis will come across people who are victims of sanctions and by far the best way to deal with this situation, given the obstinacy of the UK Government in relation to sanctions policy, is for it to be devolved to this Parliament so that we can adopt a humane approach uh, and give people dignity and respect in relation to the recipients of Social Security benefits, rather than treat them the terrible way in which the UK Government is currently treating people, particularly through the sanctions regime. Ken McIntosh. Thank you, President Officer. And could I associate myself with the remarks of the Cabinet Secretary and Ms McAlpine about the crisis report and the effect on uh, homelessness? Um, can I ask the uh, Cabinet Secretary, the, this, uh, the sanctions may have contributed to the unfortunate stall in progress that we have experienced here in Scotland in reducing the amount of homelessness in Scotland, which currently remains at around 54,000 households. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how he res will respond to that situation and what action he can take to actually uh, address homelessness in Scotland, particularly at this time of year when we actually have rough sleepers out in our streets? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I make a distinction in terms of how we approach this question, as previous administrations have done, between rough sleepers, which present particular challenges, and the more widespread issue of homelessness, which very often is a result of family breakdown, including issues like domestic abuse. And if we look at the success we have had in a whole range of areas across various parts of the country in dealing with homelessness, of course, the biggest way, the best way to deal with this is to increase the supply of housing. And that's precisely why we have committed to a nearly 70 per cent increase in the programme of building for affordable homes in Scotland over the next five years. And I would hope the Labour members would welcome that 70 per cent increase in the building programme for affordable housing. Yeah. Question number four, Drew Smith. Uh, President officer, may I ask the Scottish Government for what reason the publication of the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation has been delayed? Minister Margaret Burgess. The Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation was delayed because an, extension, because an extension to an earlier consultation which improved the geographical building blocks or data zones of the index meant that it was not possible to complete the SMID in 2015. The SMI, SIMD is designated as a national statistic by the UK Statistics Authority, and as such, the decision to delay it can only be taken by the Chief Statistician. His decision was announced in October 2014 through the SM, SIMD section of the Scottish Government website and communicated in an SIMD newsletter. There was no ministerial involvement in this decision. Drew Smith. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The decision to delay publication is obviously regrettable, but in the spirit of Christmas, can I ask the Minister uh, which targeted and redistributive policies of this Government is she most confident will have delivered a meaningful improvement in the position of her constituents and mine living in some of the most deprived parts of the country? Minister. I think a number of uh, measures this Government has taken, and I would raise childcare as one of the, the issues that we have taken to increase childcare, to assist people back into work uh, and get them back into the economy and improve their standards. But also we have taken a number of issues, uh, issues and social measures which are helping free school meals, educational maintenance allowance, the reduction, uh, the council tax freeze, the council tax reduction scheme, the Scottish Welfare Fund. All of these are helping people in deprived areas and improving their life chances. And we'll continue to do what we can to help people uh, uh, in low-income areas and deprived areas, despite the austerity forced on us by the UK government. Question number five, Mike McKenzie. President officer, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to improve the energy efficiency of existing homes. Minister. Energy efficiency is a priority for the Scottish Government and has been designated a national infrastructure priority in recognition of its importance. The cornerstone of this will be Scotland's energy efficiency programme, which will provide an offer of support to buildings across Scotland to improve their energy efficiency 
over a 15 to 20 year period. During this first development phase of the programme, we will continue to deliver our existing home energy efficiency programmes for Scotland, which provide support to households across the country. This includes local authority-led -led area-based schemes, our National Fuel Poverty Scheme, Warmer Home Scotland, and low-cost loans, which will help households spread the upfront costs of investing in energy efficiency. Mike McKenzie. Thank the Minister for that answer. I wonder if you could um, t tell me a bit more about the, how the new Scotland's Energy Efficiency Programme will build on the Home Energy Efficiency Programme for Scotland in terms of delivery in rural areas? Minister. Okay. We have established the Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force to consider the issues facing our remote uh, rural and island communities in tackling fuel poverty mm -hmm. and improving energy efficiency. And the task force is due uh, to report later next year and will incorporate their recommendations into the development of the, the new programme as appropriate. But what I would say to the member is that over the lifetime of the HEAPS programme, we've allocated over £7.4 million to Highland Council to support area-based schemes. We've increased the, the grants available to houses in remote and rural areas by almost 40 per cent. It's now £9,000. So we will build on the success of our existing area-based schemes. And once the new powers uh, over supplier obligations have been devolved, we'll have scope to tailor uh, Scotland's energy efficiency programmes so it best meets Scotland's needs. And that will very much include the rural and island communities. Question number six, Alison Johnston. To ask the Scottish Government what percentage of dwellings in the Lothian region meet the Scottish housing quality standard. Minister. The latest available local authority results from the Scottish House Conditions Survey were published in January 2015 and relate to the aggregated three-year period from 2011 to 2013. And these show that 50% of all dwellings and also 50% of social housing in the Lothian region met the housing, Scottish housing quality standard. But I would stress that this does not necessarily reflect the current level of compliance. Every social landlord in Scotland also has to provide an annual return of their compliance, which is published on the website of the independent Scottish housing regulator. The regulator has advised that from the returns made by landlords, there are 79,382 self-contained social rented properties in Lothian as at 31 March 2015. Of these, 70,620 met the Scottish housing quality standard, which equates to 88.96% of social houses, excluding exemptions. Alison Jones. Thank you. Uh, clearly, the scale of this challenge is massive. Over half of Scotland's homes are in need of repairs to critical elements, and thousands of people aren't warm enough in the winter. Reducing VAT on repairs would help, but we need to see warm homes over winter as a critical part of preventative spend, which helps keep people healthy. How does the government intend to include housing issues in health and social care considerations. Minister. What, what I would say to the member, we're already doing that. Our programmes of HEAPS and our energy efficiency programme and keeping folk warm in their homes and providing energy efficiency measures sit side and side, side by side with what we're doing uh, in health and social care. And we have, in terms of our fuel poverty group, a health professional on that group as well from uh, Health Improvement Scotland. So we are looking at that very closely. We are, we have already, I've already said this morning, uh, this afternoon, about our Scotland's energy efficiency programme, what we are currently doing with our Warm Works programme and our gen energy advice. And we'll continue to do that. And what we're also looking at in the building of new homes to ensure they are energy efficiency, as well as improving the housing stock of the current homes. Briefly, please, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. Does the Scottish Government agree that the best way to improve housing standards in the private rented sector is to incentivise landlords to invest in full quality improvements? Minister. What I would say to the member, we, we have already in the housing bill, uh, the Housing Act that was passed last year, improved standards that, that landlords uh, have to make to ensure that their houses are up to standard because it still is a problem and is showing that it's in the private rented sector that the, the housing is of the poorest uh, quality. And we've taken actions to address that and we will continue to do that in regulating letting agents, in enforcing landlord powers and giving tenants more right in our private tenancies bill. Thank you. Question number seven, George Adam. 
to, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to tackle poverty. Margaret Burgess. Our commitment to tackling the long-term drivers of poverty through early intervention and prevention is articulated in the Child Poverty Strategy for Scotland 2014-17. The strategy focuses on maximising household resources, improving children's well-being and life chances, and provision of well-designed sustainable places. It includes a full measurement framework against which the progress on the key outcomes will be measured. We have also appointed an independent advisor in poverty and inequality, and we will publish a social justice action plan early in the new year. The Scottish Government is committed to building a fairer Scotland and reducing inequalities, but we are aware that the UK Government's welfare cuts and austerity agenda will have a significant and detrimental impact in Scotland and do nothing to tackle the scourge of child poverty. George Adam. Thank the Minister for her answer. Does the Minister agree with me that it is unacceptable for the Westminster Government to spend billions of pounds renewing Trident while at the same time spending hundreds of thousands of pounds every time they drop a bomb in Syria? Is it right that they are doing all this while there is unprecedented use of food banks in Scotland? Minister, briefly, please. Um, I certainly don't think it's right. The Scottish Government is firmly opposed to the UK Government's plans to retain and renew its Trident nuclear weapons. It's indefensible that the UK Government to propose wasting £167 billion in renewing Trident nu nuclear, nuclear weapons. And it's doubly uh, galling so while people are being hit so hard by the Treasury's damaging austerity cuts, which we know are forcing people into food banks. And also the decision of the UK Parliament to expand airstrikes against Daesh are potentially counterproductive unless supported by a comprehensive strategy to bring a peaceful end to the wider conflict and build a fair and just, stable future for the people of Syria. We urge the UK Government and interna international community to work towards this end as a matter of ut utmost urgency. Question number eight, Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it expects the planning review panel to complete its work. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neill. Presiding officer, the review panel is expected to submit their recommendations to Scottish ministers in May 2016. Kevin Stewart. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary is well aware of the controversial Marshall Square development in Aberdeen. Will he consider any proposal from the review panel or others to require developers of major projects to provide 3D video visualisations of their schemes at the pre-application stage to better inform the public about Cabinet proposals? Secretary. Presenting officer, I would agree that 3D visualisations can be useful, but we have no plans at present to require them for all major projects, <coughs> but we would encourage authorities and developers to make use of them as a matter of good practice. This could be particularly helpful where there is significant community interest in a major development. Question number nine, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that it will end fuel poverty by November 2016. Margaret Burger. The Scottish Government is committed to eradicating fuel poverty as far as reasona reasonably practical by November 2016. The Scottish Government is doing everything it can to tackle this issue, and the latest statistics show that fuel poverty levels have been contained despite fuel, fuel prices rising. Jackie Bailey. I would question the Minister's response while still thanking her for it, um, because isn't it the case that the method by which you account fuel poor in Scotland has changed? So a simple manipulation of the figures has accounted for the fall and no action on the part of the Scottish Government. Isn't it therefore the truth, presiding officer, that the SNP will not end fuel poverty in November 2016? Minister. I would certainly say that we are not uh, manipulating the figures. The, the methodology used in the Scottish House and Conditions Survey to estimate fuel poverty was recently changed. Uh, the methodology to reflect the current industry standard for assessing home energy performance. But what I would say to the member is, last year the methodology changed as well, and she's well aware, and we didn't get the same criticism when fuel poverty rose by the methodology. So for the first time, the survey also includes the contribution of the warm home discount scheme and a more accurate reflection of the prices households are paying for fuel in Scotland. Question 10, Rob Gibson. 
Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pension Rights has given to the implementing of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Briefly, Minister Marco Baggi. Uh, action which gives, gives effect to rights identified in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights is central to the work of the Scottish Government. Equality and social justice are at the heart of our programme for government and we are committed to economic growth that is both sustainable and inclusive. We have taken specific actions to reflect a human rights approach, including promoting gender equality, fair work and the living wage, championing access to higher education, delivering high quality health and social care services, building affordable homes and working to empower communities and legislating for land reform. These actions contribute directly to the shared vision in Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights of a Scotland where everyone can live a life of human dignity through the realisation of internationally recognised human rights. Briefly, Mr Gibson. Thank you for that answer. Can the Cabinet Secretary offer any other examples of obligations under the UN Charter as they influence the policy drafting in planning and in housing law? Briefly, Minister. I would briefly point out that the international uh, obligations are mirrored in Scotland's approach to homelessness legislation, which ensures that all those assessed as being homeless through no fault of their own are legally entitled to settled accommodation and the work we are doing to provide uh, a ready supply of affordable housing at 50,000 in the next Parliament. Thank you. That ends portfolio questions. The next item of business is a statement by John Swinney on the draft